This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human China rights issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition Accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. Today's taping occurs on day 19 of Sexual Violence Awareness Month. So it's fitting that we'll have on the show today Aisha Shahida Simmons, founder of Afro Les Productions and of course writer, director, and producer of the film Know the Rape Documentary. As we talk a little bit about Ashley Judd's comments about hip hop and rape culture and also talk about the issue of sexual violence and rape in black communities. Later we're joined by Zahir Ali, historian at Columbia University and one of the lead researchers on the late Manning Marable's new book, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. We talk with Zahir about the Nation of Islam, the legacy of Marx number no. seven, and of course, what it meant like to work with such a great scholar like Dr. Manning Marable. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left of Black. Good afternoon and welcome to Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, your host, and we're joined this afternoon by filmmaker Aisha Shahida Simmons. I assume coming to us uh, from her home in Philadelphia, PA. I am coming from my home <laughs> on my way to the airport. <laughs> How are you doing today, Aisha? I'm great, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great, and we're so happy to have you on Left of Black. Uh, as I recall, the very first time I met you uh, was actually in a television studio at BET. Um, our friend Kevin Powell was uh, guest hosting a, a BET nighttime talk show, um, and he invited uh, uh, your, 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 you, myself, and Charlie Braxton on to talk about issues of black men and sexual violence. Oh my God, you're going way back. Is that yes, I remember that, but I didn't know that was the first time we met. Yes, I it's a decade ago, yes. Yes, that was over a decade. That was like 90. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at that time, you know, you were someone, you know, who was still very much struggling to get your film, Know the Rape Documentary, done. You know, struggling with the fundraising aspect. Fundraising with getting people to buy on to the fact that this was an important story to be told. And I think in many ways, you know, when we look at the generation of younger black documentary filmmakers who have occur, uh, emerged in the last decade or so, uh, I mean, I think you are a role model for lots of those folks, you know, the way that you wanted to make sure that you can tell the story the way that you wanted to. And, and as the writer, director, and producer of No, you know, that you now have this lasting document that, that we all look at, you know, both in terms of what it brings in terms of the conversation of sexual violence and rape within the black community, but also as an inspiration on how to get a project like this done. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things that when I have an opportunity to really engage in dialogue, particularly with uh, um, filmmakers specifically, is that, you know, there is a price to pay. Um, but I feel like it's like, you know, when you think about uh, Jimmy Baldwin, the price of the ticket, it's just like, but freedom is worth it. <laughs> and so because I was able to create um, the documentary that I wanted to create, not what um, mainstream funders, individuals thought that I should create. HBO. Um, <laughs> I paid the price. Uh, what's the response been to the film, especially these days? I mean, because you basically get to travel all around the world. Um, with the film to talk about the issues within the film, but of course talking about what it means to be, you know, an African American lesbian independent filmmaker. You know, that's that's not something that we see in the mainstream very often. You know, that's not Tyler Perry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it sure is not, because I'm not in drag. <laughs> Yeah, and I have to also include feminists because I am, you know, because right, I think right. that for me, you know, it's like my my feminist identity kind of, you know, as well as my it all is intertwined. It has been a journey, and I have been. I I feel very fortunate to be able to travel um, across this country and globally, both while making the film, but then also post making the film. And um, with the you know with the film being completed, taking it around, and now with it being subtitled in Spanish, French, and Portuguese, really. <laughs> yeah. while widening that net and it's been it's been very powerful because many people particularly when I started working on No in, in 94 as a young 24 5 year old you know like radical dyke and you know that it was just kind of like it was thought that oh I couldn't do it 
You know what I'm saying? So it was like, because I couldn't do it and be who I am. And so it's been very powerful to do it being who I am as a feminist yeah. lesbian, black feminist lesbian, and going in circle in spaces that perhaps maybe uncharted spaces, including um, black Baptist churches in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Six Mount Zion Baptist Church had a huge conference on sexual violence and healing. And they include they had me and Reverend Monica Coleman and Reverend Katie mm -hmm. Cannon. Mm -hmm. But just for myself in terms of being an out lesbian um, to speak and talk about no from the pulpit, which right. is very, spaces, very powerful. Right. Yeah. One of the things that's, that's always so impressive about the about the film is that, you know, you were very conscious to make sure there would be black male voices in the film. Yes. You know, so folks like you, Lester Douglas, um, you know, men stopping rape. Um, your father, you know, who has a tremendous presence, you know, in the film. It, what has been the response of African American men to the film? Um, you know, I could imagine there's a natural um, reaction in which folks want to feel as though they're being attacked. But you know, what has been the reaction amongst men who have to sit there and really deal with the violence that you're talking about in the film? You know, it, it's been it's been very profound. Like I feel like I am a beneficiary of the struggles. Um, that women such as Michelle Wallace and Alice Walker mm. and Ntozaki Shange mm -hmm. um, really had to deal with because I, I, I believe that as a result of their struggles of putting this work out there, that not to say that my it, ha it hasn't been a struggle with me, but it, it's not the same, that I have encountered many more um, black men who have been willing to tackle this issue. Um, those who like just come to screening for the first time and see it, and those such as yourself, as Kevin Powell, Byron Hurt, um, you know, Lester Douglas, Suleiman Nordin, my yeah. father, Michael Simmons, that there is, yeah. there are more men who are taking this issue on. I, I mean, one of the most memorable things around this film for me, uh, I guess it was back in 2003, and there was a huge screening of it um, at the Schomburg. And I, you know, I still live with the energy, <laughs> you know, the, the buzz before the film and, and, and to have a panel of black men up there talking about the importance of the film. Uh, it's still like one of the most memorable experiences I've had doing the kind of public work that I do. Um, and again, I think a lot of that is just simply a tribute, you know, to the work that you do in terms of making the film. Uh, you mentioned Intazaki Shange a moment ago, and you're watching Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with Aisha Shahida Simmons, filmmaker, activist, perhaps best known for her film, Know the Rape Documentary, uh, fitting as we're talking here doing uh, Sexual Violence Awareness Month. Um, you mentioned Intazaki Shange a few moments ago, and I know that you were many of the folks that, that were outspoken, particularly within the realm of social media, about the recent films um, done by Tyler Perry, um, in particular for his adap adaptation of For Colored Girls, but also the work that Lee Daniels did with Precious the year before. Um, and, and the idea, you know, the, this kind of interesting debate about why there aren't women directors who are behind the camera for these films, right? Why these projects you know, that are being handled by black men in Hollywood. And, and what's your thoughts about, you know, where film, black filmmaking is right now, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the real absence, until very recently, uh, of black women filmmakers? You know, I feel like it's 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 one of those last frontiers. Um, I mean, clearly, black women filmmakers are around and they're making work, but in terms of those mainstream um, films, such as If For Colored Girls Are uh, Precious, it, it's... Um, it's 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 like we're invisible and um and it's very kind of frustrating because there are men such as Tyler Perry let using him as a perfect example who's in a position powerful right. position right. And what would it be like for him to have been a producer of a film directed by Nzinga Stewart, who originally had the rights? I mean, she's an executive producer for Color Girls, but what would that film look like had she directed right. it? Um, or, or what would any film? I mean, cause that, that's the other idea. Even if Tyler Perry didn't want to give up the reins for this particular film, what would it be like to be able to produce any number of films, right? right. Given the kind of financial power and, and, and power the green light that he has, to be able to support any black woman filmmaker who could do just a little film on a budget of $2 million, you know, that's gonna tell a story that's important to us. I, I agree. I mean, which is why I'm very excited about the uh, forthcoming film uh, Pariah, uh, yeah. which Spike Lee was one of the executive producers. But here is a film that was um, directed by a black lesbian filmmaker. I mean, it, this is just kind of like, whoa, and it's being uh, it will be released theatrically this fall. Right. Or, um, I, or I will follow you as another example of something exactly. that's out there now. Yeah. Yeah, Ava DuVernay. So there is, you know, there is this movement, but as far as I'm concerned, it shouldn't, 
it, unfortunately, it's not, we're not working as enough for me side by side, that there are more, you know, we see it, um, we're talking about it behind the camera, but also in front of the camera. There, there are enough of us and racism is alive and well, but there are enough of us, and when I say us black men, who have positions of power that could use that power to say, you know what, I want a sister to direct this film. Right, right. You mentioned that you started working on No back in 1994, and you yourself uh, are a survivor. And, and it's always amazing going back and watching the film because, you know, all these folks who would tell their stories, I think about Salamisha Tillett, um, you know, who of course has taken the work that, that you know, being, being able to be honest about her own experiences in your film, and that's now translated into the work that she does with A Long Walk Home, you know, talking about these issues on the ground. And, and there's so many women in your film, you know, who, you know, may have been unknown at the time, but now in, in, in many different ways are academic or activist stars, you know, because of this story. I wonder for you, though, as a filmmaker and as someone who's always going to be out in front you know, pushing the conversation about sexual violence, do you get frustrated that, you know, almost 20 years after you started this film, there are still places where you're having the very same conversation that you were having back in 1994? Yeah, it is frustrating. <laughs> it is that, yeah, it can definitely be frustrating. Um, you know, when you kind of hear comments about, you know, like, well, why only black women in rape or, you know, uh, just this kind of I feel like still kind of questioning black women being traitors to the race when we come forward, talking about this issue, um, just kind of a lack of acknowledgement about the, the us being us being black women being at the intersections of, of race and gender and sexuality. Um, it is frustrating. It's definitely frustrating. Um, what's what is also, but I guess like the flip side is that there are more of us who are talking about it. When I, I mean, God, when I started in '94, I mean, it feels like the Stone Age is right now. It's like yeah. hardly anyone <laughs> wanted to touch the film. You know, anyone. Um, and so it's just, I mean, never in my wildest dreams that I think that it would take as long as it took or that it would have the impact that it's it's having like i just you know which is a just kind of a testament the sobering reality that we need more resources like no absolutely you're watching left the black i'm mark anthony neal we're joined by aisha shahida simmons filmmaker from her home in philadelphia pa most well known for her film no the rape documentary uh, aisha i'm gonna ask you a question about a couple of popular culture issues to, to kind yeah. of get you know your sense of what's going on um you know ashley judge comments about uh, in her memoir about hip-hop being a rape culture being one um, but also the controversy last week with kobe bryant um you know directing a homophobic slur at a referee and at the same time you know hip-hop again uh, the controversy around Mr. C um, and, 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 you know, him being arrested, um, you know, performing, you know, having a sexual act performed on him, you know, which is not the subject, right? I mean, it, that in and of itself, you know, might have been part of a discussion, but of course now it's a discussion because uh, apparently um, he was with another man or, or, or trend. And, you know, the conversation, you know, it is not an elevated conversation about these issues. I mean, it, it's really dealing with the lowest common denominator, particularly within the realm of social media. Right. I, I mean, one of the things that I, I find is that we and, you know, initially, let me just be very honest in terms of myself. I had a knee jerk reaction to Ashley Judd's comments like I completely as much as a feminist, as a lesbian, as a survivor of sexual violence. I still had a knee jerk reaction like, well, wait a minute, is hip hop the only <laughs> sexist, uh, you know, genre out there? Um, and fortunately, you know, this is why it's so important to be a part of a community, collective camaraderie of sisters such as, you know, Joan Morgan, no Noala Cabral, Salamisha Tillett. Right. You know, we've been having these dialogues, Elizabeth Mendez Perry, you know, we've been having, um, Barry, we've been having these dialogues in cyberspace and on the phone. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's it's frustrating that you know because of the impact of racism that it's it's kind of like we can't even talk about the the right. intersections we right. can't talk about right. sexual violence we can't talk about misogyny we can't talk about homophobia because we got to protect the race and unfortunately race gets equated with men so right. if we if we really want to protect the entire race then right. we would talk about these issues absolutely you know I'm I'm was very happy that men really black men uh, took a stand like that Kevin Powell, James Braxton, and Peterson, you know, that, right, yeah. you know, people were writing pieces that, and I think it's important that, you know, clearly that uh, feminists of color write these pieces, but it's very important that men of color take a stand, you know, and I'm really happy to see these things happening. Um, and in terms of, you know, for me, I'm still the Kobe and, um, and then Mr. C, I mean, just the, the homophobe, <laughs> we have to deal yeah. with homophobia. Yeah. And not this kind of like, you know, because my question is if Mr. T if somebody, if a woman, a biological woman 
were sucking on Mr. C's dick, would it have even been an issue? So, right, exactly, you know. right. It would have been a non-issue, absolutely. <laughs> right, the police probably wouldn't even have arrested him, right? Exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. So here's a, like, these are kind of one of those quote unquote teachable moments, as and I hate that term, but still where we could really flesh out, talk about, you know, sexuality being on a spectrum, violence against women and, and people, just viol sexual violence, period. You know, who, as Dream Hampton wrote in the piece, like, you know, who was the tranny that he was right. um, uh, right. uh, engaged in sexual activity with? You know, like safe sex in terms of Mr. C's wife. I mean, all these things that we could really flesh out. Yeah, but talk about, right. And instead, we just run into like, you know, either making fun of or defending. And once again, trying to figure out who the gay rapper is, right? You exactly. know, as if there's one sole body that, that, can, <laughs> that can claim that space. Exactly. <laughs> and, you, exactly. and the Kobe thing is really so interesting, both in terms of the fact, right? I mean, I, I think all of us understand that as being the part of the discourse of professional sports. Um, in some ways, this probably isn't even a controversy is if he, his utterance isn't caught on television cameras. Right. right? And, and the, the announcers having to admit that's what just occurred and the league then having to weigh in. I mean, this is just, you know, you've been around basketball courts with, with, with guys, and I mean, that's the talk all the time, right? This attempt to feminize other men using various languages, right? That are uh, misogynistic in terms of the language, but also homophobic and a range of things. And, you know, the fact that the NBA responded so quickly to it that, that uh, you know, Kobe Bryant apologized so quickly, you know, suggests that clearly there's, a, I won't say fear, right, but there is a concern that there is a, a, a group of, of gays and lesbians who are organized to respond to these kinds of things. What I think is always interesting and what gets lost in these conversations, even around the Ashley Judd stuff, is that we don't see that same kind of response when you know, discourse is raced in certain kinds of ways. No, we don't. We don't. I mean, we can look at Ben Roethlisberger. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, it becomes, it's very interesting to me, like, that I was like, wow, that was swift. Like, I wondered if Kobe had called somebody a bitch or, you know, like something, you know, or, you know, like right. how that response would be. So well, there if, is if now this, would have weighed in the same way that Glad did, exactly, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, violence against women specifically. I mean, definitely, you know, we know that men experience sexual violence and, you know, transgender people experience sexual violence, you know, all, all folks experience sexual violence, but it's just, but there is this kind of like boys will be boys. And I find that it, it, it becomes a, uh, like an, a, a transracial boys network, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that excuses uh, violence against women. You're watching Left of Black. We're here with Aisha Shahida Simmons, filmmaker, activist from Philadelphia, PA. Um, a couple of more things I'd, I'd like to ask you, Aisha, you know, while we have you on the show today. Um, what are you going to be working on next? <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm looking at two different, uh, very distinct projects. One looking at um, gender-based violence and looking at it cross-culturally, so in African descendant communities and indigenous communities. Uh, so looking, going in terms of parts of West Africa, uh, South America, and then in, in North America and um, New Zealand. So, and really kind of looking at how. Um, gender-based violence impacts communities of African descent and indigenous communities. I'm very interested in cross-cultural uh, uh, work and collaborations and work because I think that violence against women, um, violence against communities impacts us differently, but it also impacts mm -hmm. us the same and really wanting to move beyond like us against them in terms of communities of color. So that that's one. The other project that I'm also looking at is black women's spirituality in the broadest sense of the word. Yeah. So often, particularly in an African-American context, when we think about religion um, as well as spirituality, it's we think about males, men, be it, you know, Islamic or um, Christian. And I really want to hear black women's voices. I mean, there's just such a growing uh, just scholarship, womenist theology, feminist theology, but from the voices of women, not just Christian and Muslim, but also Buddhist, uh, Santeria, Condomble, you know, really branching out and hearing those voices and how women use their faith to advocate for social change. The Pew Research Search Group uh, recently, you know, issued a, a study that talked about uh, public opinions in, in the United States about um, same-sex marriage. And, and part of what the report showed is that uh, consistently, you know, African Americans lag far behind in their willingness to be able to accept same-sex marriage. Um, how do you read those numbers yourself? I'm not really sure how to read the number. I think as a, you know, as a, a 
queer identified person i just it really i think it very it frustrates me particularly with african americans you know in terms of when we think about the history of us from enslavement through present day that we couldn't even get married you know what i'm saying in terms as heterosexuals or you know this notion of family and i think that this is one of those legacies of enslavement you know that we're so busy trying to be included or be a part of the norm without questioning and challenging the norm i am curious as with all statistics how these statistics are compiled what's the you know inherent message because right. i mean definitely i think that yes homophobia is alive and well in african-american communities um but i just this whole kind of i think that there is this myth that we african-americans are the most homophobic well, and i challenge and, and that's that probably, and, and i always think you know because even with any of these surveys you, you never know what kind of questions they're actually asking exactly. folks to, to, to get the responses and i think any question that's ever and particularly to black folks <clears throat> that's going to equate same-sex marriage with the black civil rights movement, right. it's always going to generate, you know, rather harsh respondent, uh, responses exactly. from African American respondents because they don't see those connections, and and they may actually be much more liberal around same sex marriage, you know, as a day to day thing, as a decision that they'd have to concern with someone within their family or within their church, you know, than they are within the context of looking at it as some sort of erosion of black political gains over the last forty years. I completely agree. I, and I think that it's really the height of kind of that sing, that myopic thinking and it's racism in the mainstream white, gay, uh, lesbian, bisexual, transgender communities without, you know, no real respect, understanding of that history, right. no real kind of inclusion of voices from black, Latino, Asian, indigenous to, to say, hey, what kinds of questions should we <coughs> ask exactly. these right. communities? So I, I definitely agree with you on that. We've been joined this afternoon by Aisha Shahida Simmons. She is the director, producer, and writer of Know the Rape Documentary. Uh, she is the head of the production company, which you founded back in 1992, Afro Les Productions, um, which I absolutely love, you know, on your email and, you know, that's, that's your brand, you know, Afro Les. Um, so we appreciate you coming on the show, uh, talking about your movie, talking about, you know, again, rape and sexual violence. Hopefully we'll get to have you on many more times, Aisha. Thank you, Mark. It's really always a pleasure to engage in dialogue with you. Thank always. you. And safe travels. Thank you. I think it's difficult to determine uh, what anybody has done in terms of their sexual orientation, and it really should not matter. Uh, I could care less about whether or not uh, Malcolm X was a homosexual. Uh, I think that uh, the allegations uh, um, could be true, could not be true, but it's not anything that uh, should be the focus of our discussion about Malcolm X. Uh, essentially, we should look at uh, what he did as a man in terms of uh, the fight for humanity, civil rights, uh, and uh, whatever he was fighting for um, should be the focus and not whether or not uh, he was a homosexual. Uh, well, honestly, I just think it's kind of sad. I mean, it really has nothing to do with uh, his public, the public aspect of him or the public's view of him. And personally, my view uh, of Malcolm X, because he was a great man that did great things. Um, however, it po it's a possibility that it could be true, but I don't think that, one, that's any of the public's business, and two, that's any of Mirabel's business, and three, certain things uh, shouldn't be leaked even if it is the truth because that's that person's privacy so I think the comments were just a little unneeded. We live in a culture that is so built on sensationalism, what is provocative, things that are just built to sell merchandise, bent, built to basically promote material. I agree with my colleagues who probably may have said the same thing, Malcolm X is dead. Uh, what difference does his orientation have to do on the ability to emancipate a culture, to emancipate people, to put people together. I find that, you know, to even bring an allegation out at this point right now really only serves to push product and I have very little to say on that. I think one's gender, their sexuality has nothing to do with their sense and call to humanity. Good afternoon and welcome back to Left of Black. I'm the host Mark Anthony Neal and we're joined this afternoon by Zahir Ali a historian at Columbia University, a project manager and senior researcher of the Malcolm X Project at Columbia University. And you were also the lead researcher, one of the lead researchers for Manning Marable's new book, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. Thank you for joining us here today, Zahir. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to uh, talk about Professor Marable's work. And, um, and, and let's just start with that. Um, you know, legendary scholar, um, the books speak for themselves, um, particularly the classic How Capitalism Undeveloped Black America. Um, someone, you know, as, as Mike Dyson suggested in his tribute to, to Manning Marable after his death, um, someone who was really functioning as a public intellectual before public intellectuals came into our frame in the 1990s. I know one of the things that, that always impressed me about Dr. Marable was uh, his uh, column, Beyond the Color Line, you know, which he shared with the black press, you know, allowed them to reprint for free as a way to reach, you know, a wide variety of folks. Um, to start, can you talk a little bit about what your relationship was with uh, Professor Mar Marable? Yes, um, absolutely. Dr. Marable was uh, foremost uh, a public intellectual who understood the relationship between the academy and activism. Um, he, for many years, he was the founding director of the Institute for Research in African American mm -hmm. Studies at Columbia. And what a lot of people don't know is that he actually structured this institute to be a public institution. Uh, members of the public could purchase memberships and would yeah. be invited yeah, yeah. to all yeah. of its activities. They would get uh, souls, his, the journal that he established. Um, and he really saw an opportunity to engage not just the, the Columbia academic community, but the broader Harlem community as well. And so, um, you know, you could come sit in on his classes as a member of the community. And that was the kind of um, approach he had to, to his work. I came to Dr. Marable as, as many came to him as a graduate student. And my first meeting with him, actually, I was introduced to him by Michael Dyson. Um, and I was I went to see him to talk about uh, coming to Columbia and pursuing my graduate uh, studies in history. And we began a conversation talking about our, our research interests. And, you know, he asked me, you know, what is it that you want to research? And I, at the time, and, and this is still my project, I said I was interested in doing a history of Temple Number no. 7, the Nation of Islam in, in New York. And he, you know, th this was years ago, he, <laughs> before he started the Malcolm X Project. His eyes opened widely, a big smile came across his face, and he leaned forward and he said, you have to come here. And he began to tell me about his long uh, uh, standing interest in Malcolm and how he had begun and stopped and begun and stopped this work that he wanted to do on Malcolm and and he said you know if you come to Columbia um, we'll we'll be able to re relaunch this effort and so I was happy to find someone who was interested in my work and that was the kind of person Professor Marable was as a mentor he for many of us who worked with him he not only provided us the kind of uh, conventional support that a mentor and an advisor do does, but he he um, validated and helped us to validate our research interests. There were people who worked with him who did stuff on CORE, on the Black Panther Party. There's someone who was working with him on DRUM. Um, and these are all groups that had not really been given their due in, in the academy as far as historians were concerned. And he helped kind of create a space for us to, to pursue that. And so I, I worked with him as you know, a teaching assistant, as a research assistant, and, and that evolved into the Malcolm X Project, which was a comprehensive examination of the life of Malcolm. And I worked as an associate director of the project for about four years um, before handing it off to another graduate student. And, and after that, I continued to work with him as a research assistant and as a teaching assistant for his Malcolm X courses, where he would shop kind of workshop his um, his ideas about Malcolm as he was evolving, you know, as this work uh, was evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, talk a little bit about your own project. Um, you know, I, I, we're here in, in Durham, North Carolina, and the Full Frame Documentary Festival was here. And, and one of the films that they screened was the Black Power Mixtape. Um, yeah. and, and there's a good amount of footage, um, an interview with Louis Farrakhan at Temple Number no. 7. This is around 1973. And so do you think about the significance of this temple, its relationship to Harlem, leadership like Malcolm X and then Louis Farrakhan, you know, before he heads to Chicago in most recent years, at least around the hip hop generation, a, a figure like Conrad Worrell, right. you know, also being there. You know, talk about how significant this temple number seven is, not just to a, a, the New York Muslim, you know, nation of Islam community, but the broader black political community there in, in New York City. Right. 
Well, the interesting thing about the Nation of Islam is that it, and it's not surprising, that its local temples often take on the character of the city that they're in. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, um, you know, D.C. had a very kind, for, for years, even during the time of Elijah Muhammad's leadership, as well as, as Louis Farrakhan's leadership, has a kind of um, bougie, <laughs> middle class, <laughs> like, uh, respecting, you know, the black bourgeois, one of the black bourgeois capitals of, of America, right, located in the D.C. metro area, and that's because it draws on people who are well entrenched in the black right. middle class. Right. Right. Um, similarly, Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem, of course, reflected the, the, the milieu of Harlem uh, during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and, and, and even in, in the, the later part under, under Minister Farrakhan's national leadership. Um, you know, and, and in that was, you know, as Harlem was for many uh, of those earlier years, the kind of black cultural mecca. Um, mm -hmm. So did Temple Number no. 7 function within the Nation of Islam's national structure as well as, as an institution relating to Harlem on its own. And so Temple Number no. 7 was interesting to me because initially I set out to do this project to kind of put Malcolm back in the mosque is how I would quickly yeah, nice. phrase it. Because people, most people came to know Malcolm as a public figure and they came to know him especially because of the scholarship that was done up until now. Um, at focusing on his latter, like his last uh, 13 months after leaving the nation, right. because that was what all of the kind of materials that they had available to them um, could help uh, to help illuminate. And I wanted to examine the uh, social institution, the the people, the network um, that surrounded and supported Malcolm during those nine to 10 years that he was the minister uh, at at Temple Number no. 7 and understand what that environment was, what it provided to him, how it constrained him, how he influenced it, how he pushed it. And much of my uh, work with Professor Marable, so it was mutually beneficial. He was looking at Malcolm and I was looking at the community that Malcolm was in. And so it was, an, it was a perfect academic intellectual marriage <laughs> in terms of my working with Professor Marable. And, and more broadly speaking, my, my research is looking also, maybe not for my dissertation, but looking at the, the, the second decade of Temple Number no. 7's prominence, which of course is under Louis X or Louis Farrakhan, and, and looking at how that temple embodied um, both a site of resistance and a site of tradition creation as a religious institution. Yeah. Um, much of the work on the Nation of Islam, it comes from the kind of C. Eric Lincoln School of Sociology right, of Religion right. that looks at it as a kind of sociological response to white racism, which is how a lot of earlier black church studies were framed. And I think what was missing, what has been missing, except for a few like Edward Curtis, um, is looking at how the nation was also a religious community that created religious traditions, traditions right. that, you know, doubly acted as both sites of resistance and sites of, of spirituality. And I think Wallace Best, um, who's a professor at Princeton, did this mm -hmm, work mm -hmm. in the church, in churches in Chicago. They kind of, I'm looking at as a kind of model for how you can look at the, you know, black religious experience, both from its kind of political function as well as its neglected, as far as scholars are concerned, a spiritual or religious function. We're on Left of Black. We're here with Zahir Ali, historian at Columbia University, former project manager and senior researcher of the Malcolm X Project at Columbia University, and one of the lead researchers on Manning Marable's most recent book, Malcolm X, of Life of Invention. Um, with Professor Manning Marable sadly passing away, um, ironically, days before the release of the book, um, I know this has forced you to become kind of his intellectual surrogate over the last couple of weeks. I mean, you've literally been everywhere um, <laughs> talking about the book. So, you know, let me first just thank you for taking some time out to come on, uh, on uh, Left of Black, but talk a little bit about what the response has been like to the book, um, both the, the, the kind of loving treatments the book has received, um, but also some of the negative criticism of the book. Um, you know, what has been your response to those responses, and, and how do you think uh, Manning might have responded to some of this? Right. Um, well, it, you know, generally, I think most of the responses have been positive, and I think a lot of that has to do with the actual merit of the study right. and, and the work that Professor Marable uh, put into this book. I, I think that, you know, 
it it is obviously I wish he were sitting in this seat to represent. <laughs> um, it's been it's been challenging because for me and he was you know he was training me to be a historian in my own right. So for me, I, and I'm thankful to be on on left of black because I'm more interested in critically engaging the work with the Absolutely. kind of seriousness Absolutely. that it deserves, as opposed to having to defend it right. because I can write the book. Right. And I, <laughs> I mean, people have been coming after me um, because they're, and I guess we'll get into this, some of the aspects of Malcolm's life that they would have not <laughs> wanted right. to examine. People have been coming after me like I wrote the book and I didn't write the book. So, uh, but I'm honored to represent the spirit with which Professor Marable approached this research. And I'm happy and honored and very willing to talk about how he grappled with some of these issues. Okay. Um, and and also again look at you know how our responses in many cases our responses to the book are, are a little bit more telling about us than the actual historical fact. Yeah, and I think that's such a great way to talk about it. You know, I, I've been struck by the response to you know what when all is said and done is roughly about three pages right. of a six hundred page book, you know that that talks a little bit about Malcolm Little, right, as opposed to Malcolm X. It talks about Malcolm Little engaging in same sex acts. Right. Which in the longer, you know, in the larger trajectory of things, particularly in the context of a culture of hustling, um, right. I think many folks understand what that is, right? I mean, it, it is, you know, what it is. Yeah. And, I, and I've been struck about this kind of, you know, backlash to the idea that, that there's any aspect of Malcolm X's life, Malcolm Little's life, in which he could have been queer in some way. Um, right. There's a real kind of policing. Right, right. That, that's taking place within this context. Um, and, and I think you're right. I mean, it, it, I think it speaks a great deal about the way that we imagine and romanticize our leadership. You know, if in some ways Malcolm X is the perfect model for the idea of a black man who brings himself out of pathology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these narratives in some ways in many people's mind is bringing him right back down to that pathology, right? right. And, and right. folks are resisting that. Right. You know, what I found far more illuminating um, was in fact the interactions uh, between uh, Malcolm X and his wife, Betty Shabazz, mm -hmm. which in so many ways just made them like my parents, <laughs> right? <laughs> just a normal African-American couple struggling with the various dynamics of gender expectation and, mm -hmm. and trying to make a living and trying to create a family and a wife saying to a husband, it'd be nice if you would be around more right. often for these four kids. Right. <laughs> um, and I think part of what was appealing to me in terms of the book is that this was a narrative that was coming from somebody like Manning Marable. Right. Right, whose own integrity as a scholar meant that he was actually going to deal with this stuff in much more complex and sophisticated ways so that it wasn't just, you know, a trip down the rumor mill. Right. And I think, uh, you know, the I, I, I remember, you know, for many people, I think the autobiography has been a guidebook, yeah. right, for right. revolution, right. for consciousness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I read the autobiography like 25 times in my life, both you know, <laughs> leisurely and as a student and as a teacher of it. So, um, you know, that has always been like the canonical text for me of black freedom. And I remember, you know, Professor Marable and I would debate and he would say this to his class when he was teaching those. I hear doesn't agree with me. And he would just go into this deconstruction <laughs> of Abby Haley's role in the autobiography and I would wince. But, you know, I had to come to terms with and Professor Marable, I think, um, makes an important and strong case for looking at the autobiography of Malcolm X as a powerful literary text right. of transformation, right. 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 but not as a historical document. Right. And in trying to reconstruct Malcolm's life and in, in the social architecture uh, around Malcolm's life, um, he collected as much as he could. We, he, you know, he had a, a team of researchers. And we would gather um, previously published works, whatever primary sources we could find, and of course, um, this particular um, discussion of Malcolm's uh, interactions with men in the context of hustling is something that Bruce Perry actually right, raised right, right, more right. loudly and controversially uh, in 1991 or 92, about uh, uh, two decades ago, when this, when his book came out. And so for Professor Marable to do a biography of Malcolm and not con not deal with that, right, right, been, right. You, he would have been derelict in his duty. He would have been negligent as yeah, a historian. Absolutely. 
And so he had to examine what had been said about Malcolm previously. And of all of the claims that were made about Malcolm in that particular instance, this was the one he found additional documentation right. for. Right. And that's how, you know, it ends up in the book, because he's trying to give us a full, rounded picture of Malcolm and understanding all that Malcolm experienced. And and I agree with you. To me, the, the most um, compelling parts of this book are the parts of the book that are based on documents that have either not been available to scholars right. before or documents that scholars have not really critically examined or engaged before. And one of them, of course, is this letter that Malcolm writes to... Elijah uh, Muhammad. <laughs> yeah, real, like, uh, I like, this is a pastoral, <laughs> confessional letter. I mean, it's really deep. I you know, had, to, because after seeing the book, I, had, I said, well, let me reread that letter again. And it's three pages, and it's <laughs> pouring his heart out. Um, in a way that I think most men would not do today, right, 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 right. Um, much less to speak in 1959. And that speaks to the kind of sincerity that Malcolm had about uh, talking about this to his mentor, Elijah Muhammad. And he discusses the challenges he had in his marriage. And, and I, I like, you know, the way Manning uh, deals with this in the book. He puts it in the context of the kinds of public pressures that Malcolm faced. And I think, you know, people, you know, there, some historians are still debating and some people are debating, why did you have to deal with private information? That's his personal business. Um, but if you are a moral public, a teacher of public morality, as Malcolm presented himself to be, you can't discuss and d examine his public morality without examining how that plays out in his right. private life. I mean, in, in the nation, the the home is like the nucleus of the community. Right. And so you have to examine what's going on in the home. And I think that's what uh, Professor Marable tried to do here. And, and, and there's no question also that, you know, part of what made Malcolm the public figure that he was is that, you know, he really didn't want to go home. <laughs> I mean, just just on a day to day, everyday basis, right, that there was tension and, and struggle and frustration in the home. And the way that he dealt with that was to be out of the home as often as possible, right? So if that meant to take another trip to some obscure place, you know, to that's, talk to, to to talk to twenty seven people, he made that trip. <laughs> that's right, and I think that you know his family paid an enormous sacrifice. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for his work as a nation builder and an organizer. And they paid an enormous sacrifice in his death. And I think, you know, one of the things that has really disturbed me and concerned me about the discussion around this book has been an attempt to suggest that um, Manning Marable set out to attack the family or attack Malcolm's right. legacy in that way. And it's the complete opposite. Um, he had to grapple with these issues in trying to reconstruct Malcolm's life and, and helping us to understand as a community the kinds of pressure our organizers and leaders face and the kinds of responsibilities, you know, if you are traveling, you know, 24-7, 365, I mean, at, the, at a certain point, Malcolm like, is checked into the hospital for exhaustion. Right, right. And like two days later, he's out and traveling again. You know, <laughs> we have to think about the kinds of pressures um, that our freedom uh, fighters uh, experience and the, the way that they bring those pressures home to their family. Um, and I think that that provides an important way to discuss this this work. Uh, and it's not in, you know, Professor Marable um, worked, in fact, uh, to help reopen the Audubon Ballroom, the Betty Shabazz, Malcolm and Betty Shabazz Memorial Center. He used his influence at Columbia right. early right. on in the Malcolm X project to make that happen. He was very much concerned about Malcolm's legacy, but also that Malcolm's family received justice, which is why one of the things he really wanted to do was kind of collect all of these unanswered questions about Malcolm's assassination and put forth, you know, the what information he had gathered as well. To, to call for that case to be reopened. So, you know, these were his main concerns uh, in terms of completing this book was to examine Malcolm in his full humanity, to raise those questions about the assassination, but also to talk about Malcolm's evolution as a Pan-Africanist mm -hmm. and the role that Islam played in his spiritual development. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined this afternoon by Zahir Ali, who's a historian at Columbia University. One of the lead researchers for Manning Marables, the late Manning Marables, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about in relation to the book, because one of the presences that are in the book, of course, is Louis X, Louis Farrakhan. Um, and Manning Marable talked, you know, very early in the book about sitting down for a nine-hour meeting uh, 
you know, with Minister Farrakhan and, and being one of the first researchers to, to get access to their archives, right? They, I mean, this is how we know about the Malcolm X and, and Elijah Muhammad letter. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, the Louis Farrakhan, the Louis X that gets presented in this book, I think is as complicated you know, as Malcolm X is rendered within the context of this book. I mean, it, it gave me a different kind of set of blinders to think about how Louis Farrakhan has functioned within the Nation of Islam, his relationship to Malcolm X, right? And what kind of pressures he felt um, to build post-1975, right? What, what the Nation of Islam would look like. And in some ways, you know, that debate over simply being a religious organization, being an organization that's politically engaged, the Louis Farrakhan that emerges in the 1980s, you know, side by side with Jesse Jackson, is a Louis Farrakhan who's bringing the legacy of Malcolm X into the nation of Islam. It kind of bringing together those two strains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, I, I actually accompanied uh, Manning to to both of those meetings. We met with uh, Minister Farrakhan twice. Um, one was an introductory meeting, and I, <laughs> I remember going to this meeting a little nervous <laughs> because knowing that Professor Marable had publicly written critically of Minister Farrakhan's leadership, I kind of was like, I don't know what's going to happen at this meeting. <laughs> but um, to both their credits, uh, Minister Farrakhan made clear to, to us and to me before the meeting that you know he regarded Professor Marable as a giant and as a scholar and that he was... Um, not, you know, that, that by closing himself off to his critics would not help him. So he was very That's open to meeting yeah. Manning. And Manning, for his part, felt that you could not tell the story of Malcolm without understanding the inner life of the nation of Islam. And so uh, one of the contributions that this book makes is, is giving us a greater sense of the inner life of the nation of Islam through the voices of people like Louis Farrakhan and, and Larry Prescott, who is now um, one of Minister Farrakhan's aides, Abdul Akbar Muhammad. Both of them were actually critical in, in helping us get these um, missing or lost tapes of Malcolm's speeches in wow. the temple. Wow. And they were like real to real, like old real to real tapes, and and they gave them to Professor Marable, and the exchange was he got the audio restored and transcribed, and we gave them like digital copies. So it was for it, for this, it was a partnership in historical preservation and and documentation. You know, much of the Nation of Islam's archives were destroyed or lost in the transition after Elijah Muhammad's uh, leadership was assumed by his son Wallace in 1975 as part of a kind of historical revision mm -hmm. and purging of that legacy because of course Wallace moved towards a kind of more orthodox, less Islam, right? Yeah. And so for a time you couldn't say Elijah Muhammad's name in, in that community. Um, and so much of the records were actually destroyed or purged or lost. And so we were grateful as historians and researchers that they had what they did have. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, talking to that in that meeting, you know, Minister Farrakhan basically said, you know, um, all I can do is tell you my story the way I understand it. And you basically can do or will do whatever you, you know, rewrite the book that you're going to write. I can just tell you my story. And we that was that first meeting. It was supposed to be two hours. It went for like six. Then we went to dinner. It was real surreal. <laughs> um, and then we came back. We came back, uh, I think, a year or two later to do an actual oral history interview, and that went for about five hours, um, where um, Professor Marable and I walked Minister Farrakhan through like the steps of his life, encountering Malcolm, and and going through those points where, um, you know, he was able to illuminate some of the pressures mm -hmm. that Malcolm mm -hmm. felt within the nation. Um, and I think for, for 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 Minister Farrakhan's part, and for people in the nation, um, you know, they've had. A kind of um, uh, a kind of uh, mixed relationship with Malcolm because on the one hand there are many people in, and in the 80s this was certainly true who came into the nation of Islam through by, via Malcolm, Malcolm right. you know it's reading the autobiography of Malcolm X that introduces many people to the nation of Islam. I mean that's how hip hop connects to the <laughs> nation of Islam, right? <laughs> have hip hop artists who sample Farrakhan right along with Malcolm in the same song, and they both kind of feed each other. One feeds the memory of the other, and the other one feeds the political presence of the other, right? And so, um, you know, that is something that I think um, we needed to look at as as researchers.
one last thing while we have you here. Um, you know, the, the subtitle of the book is A Life of Reinvention. Um, and, and Manning Marable gave us all these different steps of, of Malcolm X reimagining himself in response to pressures, mm -hmm. in response to his own growth and maturity. Right. Um, so a bit of speculative history here. Um, you know, what do you think would have been the next stage for Malcolm X, you know, had he been able to, to, to live a longer life? Well, I think in, in one of my favorite chapters in the book is chapter 13, which covers Malcolm's second trip to Africa in the Middle East, where he spends about 19 weeks uh, based out of Cairo. This is when he goes to meet, uh, uh, try to convince the Organization of African Unity to um, condemn um, the United States the way they had condemned South Africa. Right. And this is when he addresses the parliament in Kenya. This is when he's, he's studying Islamic studies in Cairo. He travels to Lebanon. Right. He and sees this, Ali for the last time, right? <laughs> this is really, you know, he undergoes this real, you know, cultural and political shift in his thinking um, as, as a Pan-Africanist and also as a Muslim. And I think, um, you know, in, in looking at that, I think there are there's some indicators as to where Malcolm would be and how critical he would have been as we try to, you know, as America tries to uh, examine what its role to Muslims should be. And I think um, Malcolm, you know, demonstrated or, or a kind of Islam for him was the spiritual bridge to a political identity and his politics created a space for Islam in that way. So I think he would have been um, someone who continued and he, who continued, continued evolving, um, but he seemed very much grounded in a kind of growing, at that time, third world, I, now we would say non-aligned, south-south kind of, 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 of way of looking at the world, um, and, and still critical of the way capitalism had, um, you know, constrained the development of black communities in America, but also deeply spiritual as a Muslim. And I think um, you know, Malcolm didn't live for that 1965 ban on immigration to be lifted, which kind of shifted and altered the Islamic terrain in America. But I think he would have been someone who would have, uh, you know, been instrumental in keeping the voice of, and tradition of African-American Islam uh, very much uh, as a player, both in African-American politics and in, in, in Muslim uh, spiritual matters. You're watching Left of Black. We've been joined this afternoon by Zahir Ali, a historian at Columbia University, project manager and senior researcher of the Malcolm X Project at Columbia University, also one of the lead researchers on the late Manning Marable's uh, most recent book, uh, you know, his last statement, if you will, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, also senior advisor for the movie New Muslim Cool. Uh, we want to thank you, Zahir for joining us this afternoon. Special shout out to John Eason, uh, who helped make the connect with the two of us. Um, and, and I guess in a separate way, Michael Eric Dyson. Uh, it's been great talking to you, Zaheer. Thank you so much. by Duke University, online at duke.edu.